So, hi everyone, I'm Ben, along with David, I'm, a, I'm another one of the committee members for Cornwall Science Community, and I'll be chairing the questions a little later on. And as, as David says, um, after the, or during or after the talk, feel free to put a, a question in the, in the chat box, which you can access by um, moving your mouse uh, over the, the screens and it should come up under the three dots. There's a, a more section which will give you the access to the chat there. Or you can unmute yourself, as David mentioned as well. Um, before we start, um, thanks to those of you that um, donated um, when you signed up to the event. That's always very nice. We, we always put mo the vast majority of the donations we get go towards the chosen charity. Um, and at the moment, I think we've just started on supporting um, Saving Esther, which is all about the Cornish native oyster. We did a talk with, um, with Ranger, who is running all of that a few weeks ago, and you can find a talk for that on our YouTube channel. Um, this week, um, we have um, Paul from PK Porthcurno, other, you know, some of you might know it as the Telegraph Museum. And um, we're going to get to the talk in just a moment, just to highlight um, if, uh, notes, I know there's quite a few regulars along today, and good to see some new names as well. Um, if you want to get more involved with what we do at the Cornwall Science Community, uh, we have a series of different um, opportunities available on the Get Involved section of our website at the moment. And just and if none of those suit you, we're just interested to hear from people who might want to get more involved. So please feel free to get in touch with us. And actually with PK Porth Kerno as well, there was um, uh, hopefully an increasing number of opportunities as we learn how to live with, um, with COVID and things like that. Um, hopefully have an increasing number of opportunities available there and you can get in touch with them via their info at Porth Kerno uh, uh, email address that's available on the website as well. Um, anyway, I think that's enough waffle from me. So for now, um, I'll pass us over to Paul. Okay, hi everyone, evening. Um, welcome to the uh, Claw Learning Space here at PK Porth Kerno. Um, just to let you know, at the moment, we're, we're able to let you have free entry at PK Porth Kerno for a while. We've got funding to support that, along with several others, quite a few of the other museums in Cornwall. Um, we do ask that you kind of go through the website and book a space in advance because we've got to limit the numbers that come in. And hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll be able to have to have to start having school groups back in when we move on to winter opening. So after the 2nd of November, it's going to be open on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. That's my fiber optic. Um, so yeah, please do come out and see everything that's here because there's a lot more up in the museum than I have down here in the learning space. So um, this was due to be our 150th anniversary year. And obviously all of our celebrations got put on hold. So maybe we'll be celebrating 150 plus one next year, which would be a thing. So there, there, were, there were lots of really exciting things lined up that we hope to still be able to bring to people. So I'm gonna run through that 150 years fairly quickly. Normally when I do this with a school group, I think I'll flip between running through the timeline and showing some of the things back here. But what I'll do, I'll run through the timeline quickly and then we'll start looking at some of the science behind how the telegraph works and try and bring the story right up to date and how we managed to communicate with ourselves or with each other this evening now. So if I uh, go on to share screen, we've got 150 years of history over here and we're going to try and run through it fairly quickly. The, actually, the story begins really more than 150 years ago in the, the, the late sort of 18th century when people started making discoveries about electrical currents and what they could do. And uh, Hans Christian Ernst did found out about the magnetic effect of a current. And then people thought, oh, that's handy. You can, you can send signals. And you would have had um, short distance signaling uh, uh, in, in like houses. You probably see the remnants of them in, in doctor's surgeries that are still based in old houses now. But by uh, 18, 1839, they had a telegraph connecting La uh, Paddington Station to West Drayton, just outside London, because one of the first obvious uses for a telegraph over a longer distance was to let people know the train was on the way. And of course, one of the other things they discovered through that was that uh, different towns had the minute hand on their clocks in different places at the same time. People kept uh, mistiming things with the trains. There's a famous story about the first train in Bristol from London being missed by the mayor because the Bristol's 10 minutes behind London when you set your clock by the sun. So you would have found a lot of clocks in towns that was a famous one at Temple Meads for quite a long time with two minute hands on. So people then began to think, well, what else can we use this telegraph port for apart from telling each other what the time is and when the next train's going to arrive and businesses as well as uh, domestic use began to think, well, let's, um, we could send messages very quickly all over the country. So 
by the 1840s, things started to get more ambitious and people said, well, why can't we send the messages to another country as well? So they found gutta percha. It's a very rough rubbery material. It was very popular at the time in uh, uh, false teeth and uh, inside golf balls. But it turned out to be really good for insulating and waterproofing cables as well. As well. So after a few tries, uh, they managed to get a, a waterproof cable underneath the English Channel and send messages through David the Calais. A few people thought they'd caught a new species of fish on the way, but uh, by 1851, you could communicate from Dover to Calais, and of course, then from anywhere in Britain to anywhere on the continent, because once you're on the continent, you can go over land. So the, the, the vision of uses for communicating around the world was driven really by businesses and by empire. So um, John Pender, who became Lord Pender, wanted to set up a cable for uh, business use across the Atlantic among other things. And of course, in the other direction, there were cables going all the way over to India. So that by the time the mid uh, 19th century here, uh, the time it took to get a message to a far flung outpost of empire over in India went from about six weeks to about nine minutes overnight once the cable was fully connected. It took a few goes to get cables working properly across the Atlantic. SS Great Eastern was involved in it. But eventually there was a reliable cable and Pender was looking for a good place to put the cables out to sea. Falmouth would be popular because it was busy, lots of ships went there and things like that, but it turned out the ships were a problem because you would keep breaking the cables with anchors and fishing nets and all those kind of things. So at Porth Kerno, not only do you save a few miles of cable under the sea, you also uh, have a very, very quiet place because almost everything that's in this valley at Porth Kerno arrived here because of the telegraph cable, not the other way around. It didn't come here because there were people here to work on it. It came here because there was nobody here to break the cable under the sea. So over the years, there were lots and lots of developments and then a rival as well, when Marconi sent his radio message across the Atlantic from Poldhu, just around by the Lizard. Um, there's, uh, we won't go into it this evening, but there's one of the, uh, an early story of industrial espionage involving a stage magician and all sorts of shenanigans between the cable company and Marconi's radio. Big gap now, big jump to 1941. Lots of interesting things happened in the next, in, in, in the uh, meantime, but one of the things that we have up in the museum there is an ax that was used over in the Indian Ocean by some people from a German warship during the First World War to cut some cables and smash up the equipment. So, when it looked as if there was another war approaching in the late 1930s, a decision was taken to dig some tunnels into the cliff here at PK and house all the telegraph equipment in there, kind of a ready-made air raid shelter inside the cliffs. And that was completed in 1941. And a good thing too, because the headquarters of Cable and Wireless in London was bombed and a lot more cable traffic came through Porth Kerno then, even than they were expecting. And if you come out to visit us here at Porth Kerno, you can actually go, well, actually, I say that, at the moment, you can't go into the tunnels because of, because of spacing, but in normal circumstances, you can go into the tunnels, you can actually get right to the top of the cliff from inside the tunnels. That's fine. In 1950, as well as being the cable station here, it became a a training college for uh, telegraph engineers from all around the world. Um, eventually, there were, there were around 100 students from, from the UK, from the West Indies, South, um, South America, the Middle East, and all over Africa and Asia. People came here to Porth Kerno to train, to run telegraph stations. Things began to change after about 1956, when the first transatlantic telephone cable was completed. And gradually over the next couple of decades, more and more people got telephones at home. So the, the telegraph and the use of telegrams went into decline, if you like. So by uh, 1970, there was not really any need for a cable station here anymore, but the college remained, the training college for cable and wireless for a few more years. Eventually though, by 1993, the training college moved up to Camp uh, Coventry, and uh, that is when moves began to, to turn the old buildings here into a museum, the cable, and then over the years that's it's grown and grown, and now it's become PK Porth Kerno, 
uh, Museum of Global Communication. Um, the next picture is something we'll be looking at later, so to talk to you now. So what's the science behind all of those things that made all of that work? We've got uh, quite a few of the things here, and I'll, I'll try and bring the whole thing up to date as we go. But um, this one is very hard to see. I, I did some trying out with the, the different lighting arrangements and the camera settings here. So it's, this is about the best I can do. Anyway, if in here, there's a, there's a small compass needle. So you can just about see against the dark background. And this is basically Ersted's experiment. So if I turn on the electric current through this metal frame, you should see the needle move. And the red end of the needle is now pointing away from you and the white end is pointing towards you. So just to confirm it's really the current that was doing this, Ersted would have switched the current into the opposite direction and then tried it again. And now the red end of the needle is pointing towards you and the white end towards the picture behind there. So this is the magnetic effect of the electric current. And people began to find ways they could use it. I'm just going to move this item across there in a minute. So, this one, out. one of the simplest things you could do with, with this magnetic effect is, is to coil your insulated wire around a piece of iron. Iron being a magnetic material, helps to concentrate the magnetic field. So if I turn the current off, and put this little hand on it, it falls off, as you would hope. But if I switch on the current, that stays and The weights will stay hanging on there until I turn the current off. And they'll even stay there for a little while. Yes, on Monday, they stayed there for a little while after it turned off, because sometimes the, the iron core retains part of the magnetic field that was put there by the electric current. Sometimes it doesn't keep it for very long, as you can see. So that's just the very simplest thing you can do with the, the uh, magnetic effect of the It's just holding, pick things up with an electric So, that's uh, thing number one. So once you can do that, if you if you set something up that's got some kind of a spring on it, you, it will then go back to where it was before the current was, was uh, switched on, and it will click. So you can you can make noise. So when you've got something like this, if I do this, it's a switch for the current, and I can make a similar apparatus at the other end of the circuit click when I turn the current on and off. When they first started to do this, they would need to switch their apparatus between send and receive. So they would be on send, send the message and receive, they would listen for the clicks. And when they started using things like this, around the middle of the 19th century, that's when Samuel Morse invented his Morse code. And there's a little bit of a tragic story behind that, which we may have time to go into later. So that was the simplest way to do things, just sending the Morse code like this. Um, when they started to send the messages under the sea, the same kind of idea, they had these cables. So here we've got, there's, there's the gutter percha that I was talking about there. In the middle are three copper conductors and then around the outside we've got armour. And I always ask this question and sometimes people see through. I've got two cables here, this thin one and this one with a double layer of armour. And the question is always, which one is for far out where the ocean is very deep and which one is for near the shore just on the beach so you can have a think about that and maybe someone can give us a suggestion later on so which one's for deep in the ocean and which one is for near the beach so with more discoveries and developments in uh, electromagnetism other things were found as well so there's the electric motor which sometimes needs a bit of a nudge to get started. So here, we have a magnetic field. We have some coils of wire there. So when the current flows through the wire, there's a magnetic field in the wire that's attracted to one side of the magnet, repelled by the other, 
and the whole thing spins around and keeps spinning around. It's a very clever arrangement at this end to help make sure it can keep turning and the current can go through so you're not twisting wires up all the time. Now the, the motor is using energy from electricity and a magnetic field to produce motion. So the obvious thing to think then is, why well, could we do that the other way around? So we have the dynamo. I've got to remember, we've, we've got, there's a little LED in this, so it only lets the current go, there it goes. So using energy of my motion of my hand now, a conductor, magnetic field, I'm doing the energy transfer of the motor in reverse. So the mechanical energy from my hand is being transferred to electrical energy in the coils, which can then light the LED in this case. Or if you do it on a BF scale, power the entire world. So I've got another thing to show you that is related to that. But I'm just going to let you think about it. So I've got if you'll see I've got two nice magnets down here and two tubes. Now you'll have to get the timing from me, I think. If I drop the magnets into this plastic tube, they drop, they land. Whereas if I put them into this copper tube, same length, same diameter, I drop. they land. So the question for you there is why the difference? Why does it, why do the magnets fall so much slower through the copper tube than they do through the plastic tube? Let's store those on there so I don't lose them. So these discoveries and inventions to do with it, uh, the electromagnetic effect led to uh, lots of uh, very interesting and, and uh, well, inventive in a lot of ingenuity. I think that's the word I was looking for in uh, in telegraph equipment because it turned out, not surprisingly, that the further you went along the cable, the weaker the signal was. So that you needed something much more sensitive than the apparatus I showed you just now to detect the current. So up in the museum, too big to bring down here, we've got some. Uh, very big uh, mirror galvanometers that can detect really, really tiny currents. One of the problems with them was that they went very slowly. So the needle or the, the, the light that signaled that the current would move at about this speed. So if you're trying to look for dots and dashes of Morse code, it, that's, it's, you know, it's quite hard because if it's going really slowly, a dot or a dash could take ages. So they decided to, to make the cable code rather than dots and dashes, the galvanometer moving left or moving right. And this enabled them with a little bit of thinking to start recording the messages because if you run a paper tape along and the, current, the, the galvanometer, the same effect as works the galvanometer, swings a siphon to and fro, then an ink trace will move left and right and you've got a recording like that. The next thing they thought was, well, why not punch holes either side of uh, a sheet of paper for the dots and the dashes so that as well as a recording, you could run the piece of paper through and the electrical current will go through the holes but not through the paper and you could use that to send a machine. So rather than having a key a message with a kind of a two, uh, a two key Morse sender, you could just run the paper tape through a machine and the machine would send a message. So you, you could use a, a keyboard like a typewriter to produce the paper tape then the paper tape would go through in the machine and that would send the dots and dashes or lefts and rights much more quickly. So that was really, really good. But you still had to have somewhere in the ocean, a cable station on an island, like Ascension Island, for instance, to record, uh, to take in the very weak message as it came in and then send it out again on the next leg of the cable. And this was time consuming and it involved quite a few people. So by the 1920s, we just the electromagnetic technology like this, they developed a way to uh, automate that whole process. So their technology was based on clockwork, 
electromagnetism, and that's it. If you've got electric motors, you've got magnetic switches, and you've got clockwork and clocks, and everything has to keep in perfect time. So there's automatic system. So if a clock at one end of the system starts going fast, there's an automatic system to slow it down. If it goes too slowly, the system will speed it up so that the, everything's in perfect synchrony and the messages can be read by the machinery at each end. And so the job of running that kind of machine became very, very specialized. We have a few people here as volunteers who actually keep some of this equipment running up in the tunnels. It's called Regen. I'll show you a little picture of it. And there's Regen. So it takes up about half the length of one of the tunnels and it's a simulated system of, of what would be in other countries. And we were lucky, very lucky to have a couple of, of some, some people here who can keep that working. Um, understanding how it works is reasonably easy. Actually keeping it going is, is much, much more difficult. Okay, so that's Regen. Another thing that you've got to think about when you're doing this, and this is the one I really wanted to tell you about today, was, was what do you do if the cable under the sea breaks? Do you have to go across the whole ocean to, to figure out where the cable's broken? Now, you've got a cable ship, and it's easy enough to come up with an idea of what to do to mend the cable. You need some kind of grappling hook. You drag it along the seabed. You find the cable, and then you haul it up onto the ship. But how do you know where to look? in the first place. And so a bit of clever thinking made people realize they, they knew that the electric current was carried to receive it. In fact, during World War I, there was a thing invented called the Fuller Fund where the, the, the earth became part of the telephone circuit in field communications. And there are a lot of stories behind, uh, around that as well. Anyway, if you break a cable, there can be a return current through the seabed. So if you know the average electrical resistance for a mile of cable plus seabed and you can find some way to measure the electrical resistance in that circuit then you can you can estimate where the break is in the in the cable now anyone who's done a-level physics might recognize this this is a wheatstone bridge and basically the idea here is that the ratio of the resistances on each side is the same when there's no current going up through that bridge in the middle. So the galvanometer there is shown in the needle pointing one way. You've balanced the resistances when there's no current going through there. And so if you know three of the resistances, two of them are fixed. One of them is the one you control from the testing room here at Port Kerno. The unknown one is the resistance of the cable plus the seabed. And so if you know the resistance per mile, you can work out how far out to look for the break in the cable. So the principle, if you've done it in a, in a nice physics classroom at school, it's reasonably simple. You measure the ratio of the resistance, as you do your calculations, you can find the thing. There were, however, quite a few complications because there are currents induced. Once you've got a bit of a leak in the cable, seawater and the copper can make a battery. And so you've got voltages there that you won't have accounted for back in your testing room. Um, sometimes a cable can break and then the gutter percha can seal the end. And so there won't be a return current. And then you've got to use uh, measurements of electrical capacitance to, to find the, the properties and, and work out the length of cable to the break. Um, so things do get more difficult, much more difficult than in your A-level physics classroom, but they did it. They, they managed to work it out. So you, you go out and you, you find the broken end of the cable. And once the ship goes, once it knows where it's going, another thing it needs to do is, is uh, people need to let them know when they've got there and be able to start testing that, that, that they've got the right cable and that, that it is continuous all the way from where they are. So once they know pretty much where they're going to go and how long it's going to take, the cable stations at each end have to have somebody watching for a signal from the ship permanently. Now, that was a, a very, very boring, but very important job. And it was really important that you responded to the ship as soon as it tried to communicate with you once it had found the broken end of the cable. So you could spend days and days just watching this apparatus to see that a signal comes through. And eventually they, they find that, so they know they've got the right cable. So they put a buoy on it to float it so they know where it is. They go and find the other broken end, do the same process with the other cable station. And once they know they've got the, the two broken ends of the same cable, join them together up on the ship and they sink it back to the bottom of the ocean 
and away they go. You've got uh, communication again. And because little bits of damage can make the electrical properties of the cable change a lot over time, that can make the, these measurements difficult. And uh, one of the other things it made uh, turned into an art form really in the testing rooms was, uh, or, or in all of the cable stations was uh, to be able to send messages in both directions at the same time. Because initially you would build a circuit, somebody at this end would send a message, somebody at the other end would receive, and then they would talk over and the message would come back. Using the same kind of Wheatstone Bridge idea, and I haven't got a diagram of the whole thing, but by attaching a Wheatstone Bridge at each end, that can balance the outgoing signal so that it doesn't affect your apparatus so that they can be sending a message in from the other side and your apparatus will only detect the message that's coming in and the Wheatstone Bridge apparatus cancels what you're sending out. So you only hear the message you need to hear, which is very, very ingenious. But again, because of these effects with slight leaks and uh, the battery effect of the seawater and the copper under the sea, this constant process of adjustment needing to go on at the shore end in this piece of apparatus here, which was to balance the cable, the resistance of the cable. It tried to mimic exactly, as far as possible, the properties of the cable that was being balanced out for the duplex, the two directions operation. So a big box full of resistors back in the cable station to balance out the cable under the sea. So there was quite an art form, a lot of intuition as well as, as, well as knowledge and expertise in, in keeping that balance between the artificial line and the line under the sea. So a lot of inventions went on. So uh, eventually after the telephone came in, we've got rapid development starting in the last part of the 20th century up to today. Um, from satellites, more radio, telephones under the sea. Then in the middle of the 1960s, Charles Cow invented optical fibers. And that's what's making our uh, modern world possible. So I'm just gonna bring this into place and hopefully point the end of the fiber towards the camera. Let's move it down this way a bit. There we go. I've got to find the other end, which is here. So I'll take this other end and this torch and if I shine a torch into this end of the cable hopefully you will see there you see the light coming out your end and off on off on off brilliant so that's basically what we do today we send the messages through fiber optic cables and of course be in the modern world once we've invented something so fantastically useful, we have to turn it into a toy. So that's where you'll see most fiber optics in everyday life, just little bits of plastic. When you go to the pantomime, if the pantomime ever comes back. So that's how we do things today, fiber optics. Just to show you that you can carry a signal on a light beam, I've got here a laser and a laser detector and an iPod. I've chosen this song for a reason, or this tune for a reason. You should hear it. And so that we know it is the light beam that's carrying the message. Put my hand in the way. It's off. Take it away and it's back. Now the thing with your optical fiber is it manages to keep that light signal inside the fiber all the way from one end to the other with very small losses. But just like though with the, uh, with the electrical signals going around the ocean, you had to have your relay stations by the pre or post automation to boost the signal. We have the same thing under the ocean now. There are optical amplifiers. We've got a model one up in the tunnels. It's about this big but the, the real ones are about the size of a cow and they sit under the ocean, boosting the, boosting the light signal as it goes around. So 
And that's how we do that. Now, up there, I don't, don't know if you can read what's up there, but basically it says, police station, asleep, unicorn, librarian. And that's how I remember to spell my name in Morse code, because the rhythm of those words and phrases fits the Morse code for those for the initial letters. So P is dot dash dash dot, and that fits the rhythm of police station. And I found those in a, in a thing from World War II when they were trying to train lots of people, get lots of people to learn to use Morse code. And I find that when I use that with schools, it's a little bit dated. I can't use some of the things there because they really don't get them. And even for the letter O, it has Old King Cole. And I had a school here once over four days, they brought 120 children and about five of them had ever heard of Old King Cole. So that's quite dated. So uh, a fun thing to do might be to come up with your own set of mnemonics to try to remember the Morse code symbols for all the letters of the alphabet. Um, I, I try to get schools to do it occasionally. And uh, they, they come up with some quite, uh, quite interesting ideas. I've, I've tried looking on the internet for some modern versions on, on it, and some of them are really strange because they, they come up with a phrase that's the right rhythm, but they don't start with the right letter. And then there's a whole chain of association to try, try to get from the phrase to the letter it's supposed to be. And I don't find that very useful myself. So we do that. So we've gone from very simply holding things onto other things using electric current to be an electromagnet to communicating instantly all around the world. I mean, it's, it's really the development now is, is at least as rapid as it was when the Victorians first built the telegraph, maybe more so. We've gone from really the first, first mobile phone in 1983, the first smartphone in 1992, Skype for telephone calls only in the, in the 21st century, and Skype free for video calls, not until 2013. So things are going really, really fast now. Um, but underneath it all, although I mentioned satellites earlier on, 97% of all the internet traffic in the world is going through cables under the sea. So basically the idea that the Victorians had, a uh, code with two symbols, send some kind of signal through the cables under the sea to get all around the world, exactly the same for us now as it was for the Victorians and the Telegraph. So you might want to think about what it is that developments have made it possible to send so much information so quickly, because in principle, we could do all of this with Morse code, but we don't, because it would take far too long. We can do it much, much more quickly with the, with the methods that we use. So you can think about what are the differences that make it possible to send so much information so quickly, almost instantaneously, all around the world to anybody. It's not the principle that's underlying it because that is uh, a two symbol code and cables under the sea, exactly the same as the Victorians had. So that's, that's really 150 years of history and a little bit of technology in a short amount of time. So there you go. And, and if you want to see more of it, please do come out. Remember, it's free entry at the moment and, and there's loads to see and still a few things to do up in the museum and the tunnels. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. What a, what a yeah. fantastic talk. And um, well, I don't think we've ever, ever had so many demonstrations of things in a, in a talk as well. That was brilliant. And, um, and like you say, it'd be great for people to get along and get to the museum. Did you say earlier you, you should book ahead if you can? Yes, if possible. Yeah, you can find details on the, on the uh, PK Fourth Journal website. Fantastic. OK, brilliant. Well, for, for, for those of you in, in the audience, um, I'm sure many, many of you here today are seasoned veterans now of Cafe Sci. But if you have questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll get to that. Um, I noticed Chris and Robin put one in fairly early on, and it was something that caught caught my attention um, as well. Was um, they say oh, oh, that we'd really like to hear the story of the industrial espionage and the magician to do with uh, Marconi? I think it was um, Maskelyne family. It, 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 they just, it, I think the first Maskelyne was a, was a stage magician in Victorian times, and there was a, there's a whole f series of descendants of this guy, and um, the final one ended up in the Second World War, and he's meant to have made the whole city of Alexandria appear somewhere else during the Second World War, so that some empty place got bombed. And some of the stories about him, I thought people think, must be made up. 
well, some of them may be true, but the original one was, was when, the, when the radio first started to be a rival to the Telegraph, uh, Maskelyne came along and listened in to some of Marconi's radio messages. And then the cable company was able to say, well, you customers should stick with us because anyone can listen to what you're sending on the radio, but our cables are lovely and secure under the sea. So no one will listen to what you're saying. Kind of like we get with VPN companies now saying, keep like all that, your data yeah. <laughs> it's secure yep. with them. That. Oh, well, that's, well, that's interesting. Um, got a question that's coming from, from Henry here, which is, um, does your history include in Mar in Marsat, sorry, I haven't heard of that before, so sorry if I've pronounced it wrong, in Marsat and the technology connected with Goon Hilly? Not so much, no, because, because uh, really the cable and wireless training college is mainly to do with the, the keeping the telegraph systems going and things like that. So wireless got into the name because they took it, uh, the, the, the company got involved in all kinds of communication. But nowadays, lots more companies actually run cables as well. You've got Al Patel and people like that who are laying cables all around the world. So really the satellite communication like that is, is a lot to do with well, the people that originally, the GPO, when they started out doing Illy. And um, I think not so much of that history here. We do have some, some radio exhibits at the museum, but mostly based around uh, World War One and Two type equipment. Great, thanks. Um, I've got a question here from, from Peter, which uh, ties into something I want to talk about actually, which was, which was just asking what does the PK stand for? And, um, and actually along with that, I'd be just interested to know a little bit about um, why the rebrand to PK Fourth Kernow from um, the Telegraph Museum? Right, well, partly it was to do with expanding uh, the, the, the kind of things we talk about and do here, because obviously global communication is a lot more than just the telegraph. Even at the time their cable college, the college closed here, there was a lot more to what went on here than just telegraph. So rather than just being a museum of submarine telegraphy, we're talking about worldwide communication, global communication and all aspects of it now. The PK really is just because, I mean, I, I remember there was a little bit of chat on Facebook saying, well, why PK? Well, nobody, but it turns out pretty much everybody that ever worked here knew it as PK. It was a call sign for Porth Kerno. So it really, it's, it's its name, PK, stands for Porth Kerno. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, question here from David. So uh, he says, I love the demonstration of transferring information by light. Uh, and he really likes the notion of parallels between telegraph and fiber optics and was wondering about um, broken fiber optic cables. How do you know where the break is on these and is the principle similar to the telegraph? I think it is. I did a little bit of reading about this. I don't know the exact answer, but I'm pretty sure from what I've read that you get similar kinds of effects. So that for instance, there will be a bit of a reflection from the broken end of the cable. And that kind of defect in a signal as it bounces back can be interpreted and detected and the time it'll be time of flight if you like rather than electrical measurements that give you the um the distance because you know the speed of light in the fiber um Got it. yeah yeah no that that, that um yeah, that's really interesting that makes yeah, yeah that's really cool um Actually, David had something prepared. So you mentioned earlier the two different cable sizes, one yeah. might, which um, whether we thought, you know, we thought they'd go in, which one would go in the sea and which one would go in nearer the shore. David, you had a poll you set up so everyone could have a vote to see what answer we think is which. So you, you should all be able to see that on your screens now. So yeah. um, it says, is, um, is the cable with the thick armor for in the middle of the ocean or near the beach? So, so far, all right, we've got an overwhelming uh, number of votes for near the beach so far. Right, that in, means in, yeah. In in my head, I would have, I would have said, if you hadn't asked the question, I'd have said, oh, I think the thick the thick one would be out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, maybe it's because you asked the question, people think, oh, maybe it's the other way around. It it could be that, yeah. Um, a lot of the time with school groups, they go for the thick one out, out in the ocean. But of course, if you remember why they chose Porth Kernow in the first place, it was because it wasn't busy. There weren't people, there weren't loads of boats out in the cove fishing. 
And so there was far less chance of catching the cable just near here in a fishing net. By the time you're in a deep ocean, the nets don't go that deep. So you don't need as much armor. Another thing is the weather. Um, you've all been to the beach after a storm and the sea is all cloudy because of the sand and seabed has been churned up. And you don't want that happening to your cables. So you want lots of armor where that's gonna happen. Once you're far out in the ocean, it's too deep for the weather to reach it. So you can get by with less armor. It's really, really interesting. It obviously makes a lot of sense. Do, do the cables still get um, exposed at, say, if there's, if there's been a storm and a lot of the sand gets washed away at Port Kerno? Yeah, as far as I know, I haven't been here in the summer for a long time after a storm. But yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, was, I remember coming here when I was young, when things, life was a lot quieter and you could always find a parking space. And uh, yeah, when I was a kid, you'd come down here after a storm and you'd see the cables exposed. Brilliant. Thanks for that. I'm just having a look through some of the other questions we've had coming in here. Um, we've got one here from Susanna, which says, um, were there problems with marine creatures burrowing into the um, gutter percher? Uh, well, the gutter perch is inside the armour, so not so much, but uh, as I have heard at least one story of a shark tooth actually in, stuck in the armour of the cable. Yeah, but it is one of the things you need to think about. And, and I know up in the uh, tunnels, you can see a, a, a small model of a, a trenching tool, which actually goes to the bottom and goes to the seabed, digs a trench, the cable goes into the trench, and it's covered over. So that protects the cable from that kind of thing. Good to know. Um, I had one here, another, another one from Chris and Robin here, which says, um, uh, grant the threats of um, terrorism or blackmail, how safe is the cable we now rely on? Does it need to be camouflaged in some way? Well, there was, there was an interesting thing. One of the newspapers about, was it a couple of years ago? Um, because you know, there's still cables come ashore over at Senan with fiber optics coming in there. There's some at Bude. And someone from one of the newspapers did a little tour of the bases around the place. You sometimes see little satellite dishes in them and things like that. And actually was able to walk in through the gates of quite a few places where they thought they, they shouldn't. So yeah, I think it is, um, it is a concern, but I, I, I don't know how much of a concern it is for people because pretty much every country depends on it but it is certainly something that's worth finding out more about um and if, if you drop me a line i'll see if i can find anyone who knows more to to find out how much of a threat that really is yeah it's not something that occurred to me before so yeah so that's, that's a really interesting thought got just a, a point here from from henry who um is one of our regulars we've heard about some of um the exploits with exploits with the Coast Guard. So when Henry was with the Coast Guard at Falmouth, he had a they had a chart that showed where cables were. So if a fishing vessel got snagged, we could uh, hit so they could see which um, one it was on and contact the company to see if they cover the cost of the drop gear. That's that's quite interesting. I didn't realise there was um yeah. charts like that around. Yeah, there, there was one on a wall over there, but it's not there anymore. But yes, there, there's uh charts with all the cables, not just the not just the cables that are working, but also cables that are redundant, which are still sitting on the seabed. There are power cables connecting the UK and Ireland and UK and France, which also need to be taken account of. And I'm not sure whether it's maybe compulsory for fishing boats to have those maps and avoid the cables. Because there's, I mean, obviously there's two reasons to avoid the cables. One is not to break the communications and two, is not to lose your gear or sink your boat. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, and I can imagine, so do, do cables ever get recovered when they're no longer needed or is it, are they just left there afterwards? Is that the more as common thing? As far as I know, and again, this is something that probably you'd need to check, but I did hear a couple of years ago that the value of the scrap metal in the armor and the rest of the cables had finally got high enough to be worth taking ships out to pick the stuff up. Because if, if, if the price of scrap steel, which most of the armour is steel, and there's some copper in there, if the price of those materials wasn't high enough, it wouldn't be worth taking the ships around to find it all. Yeah, so a lot of effort for not a lot of payoff yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. As far as I know, that started fairly recently to be a thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I'd imagine there's quite a few to, to take up eventually. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, got a message here from Amy uh, Amy Rudd. He says, greetings from 
WV, Waterville, uh, in Kerry, uh, the Island Cable Station. That's cool. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting PK in 2018 and hope to be back. Um, when you're doing demos with school groups, what is the demo that grasps their imagination the most? Um, I tell you, it's different, different things with different groups, really. I mean, a lot, a lot of them like to see the fibre optic and see the light going around because they often, especially as they get to the towards the top tubes and things like that, they're learning things about light going in straight lines. And then we have this cable going all, all over the place and the light gets to the other end. So that, that's quite cool. They, they, do, they do like to think about the, uh, and, and see the, the thing with the magnets falling down through the pipes. And um, I try not to give away the answer to that too soon. And when I've got groups of children around, I let them have a good think about it because it's, it's worth thinking about because they, there are a lot of things about the two, or there's one thing in particular about the two pipes, one difference between the two pipes that is the really obvious thing that's the answer and it's not the answer. So that's, that's quite a nice thing to do with children because they see the big difference as it falls down. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. Actually, it'd be, it'd be good to see if anyone wants to have a pop at answering the question, why did the, the magnets fall slower? Um, in the copper pipe compared to the plastic one, pop it in the chat and we'll see if we can come up with it. Um, David's asking what the answer is. Well, let's, let's see if anyone can come up with it first. We'll, we'll, we'll pop a few suggestions. Bit. Yeah, we'll leave it for a second. We'll tell you before we go. Yes, yeah, we will, we'll wrap that one up. Um, uh, Peter Freeman, uh, question here about, um, where oh, I've lost it, where am I going? Bear with me a second, losing control of the chat. Here we go. He says, uh, Peter says, are cables going to become redundant when Elon Musk and others launch um, their thousands of satellites? And what's the economics? Um, I'm not sure. I, don't, I know a little bit about Elon Musk. Too. I know there's, there's some astronomers who are not keen on it at all because the, the whole fields of satellites are going to put huge streaks on their photos of stars, especially if it grows a lot. As far as I can make out, though, um, it's... It's not to bring the internet to everyone, but it's it, it's brought it to. I know I read the other day that it had brought the internet to to um, some people in a very remote part of the USA that had never had it before. Because there comes a point, I think, when for one reason or another, somebody's felt it's not worth even over land or underground taking the cable there. So the satellite is get, getting the internet to places where people have felt like that about it. Um, but again, as I say, I've, I've read quite a few astronomers getting a bit annoyed about it. Yeah, something I'm sure we'll see develop over the coming months and years. Yeah. Um, another question here from David. Um, was there any sort of settlement at, at Porth Kerner before the Telegraph? Um, he says he finds the history of the college there quite interesting too. Do you know more about it and was it a big school? Yeah, I mean, as I said, the, the reason Port Kenner was chosen was because there wasn't much going on. There were farms around, farmland, but nothing happened down in the sea, down at the cove. But the college did grow to be quite big, and people came here from all over the world. They, they had sports clubs. I remember when I was a boy over in Newlyn, uh, you would you'd hear about the exiles coming to play cricket or rugby against the local teams, the local village and town, town teams. The exiles were going to play, and that was the people from here. They, they put on, uh, they, they got a, a good associationship going with uh, Minac up at the top of the cliff there. And so they would, they would be involved in sometimes in acting and sometimes the technical side of, of uh, amateur dramatics up at the Minac. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, so obviously, yeah, you used to forget you have something like that just on the, the doorstep as well around there. So there's a lot more to Porth Kona than meets the eye when you first go. Yeah. Um, question here from Heather. Um, what happened to the first cable laid by um, the Great Eastern, which was too sh uh, was too short when they arrived at the Sillies? Um, I don't know that one. Yeah. <laughs> send send me a reminder. I'll see if I can find out. Yeah. Um, it's not one I was aware of, but that sounds sounds like a miscalculation on someone's part there. Um, we've had no guesses about the pipes yet, so um, I'll give it a little longer just to see if anyone wants, wants to wants to throw one out there. Mm. I mean, one thing that turns up with the idea of those early cables breaking when they were trying to lay them is, is that really the, the, the telegraph sort of gave birth to the science of um, oceanography or, or at least studying the seabed because it gave a reason for looking that far down and seeing what was there because obviously you don't want to be losing cables all the time. 
So it's worth finding out what the seabed's like. Yeah, absolutely. It's got hand in hand. I mean, it's a little bit like the um, growing up alongside the railways because the railways didn't just produce, uh, give a, a good reason for wanting the quick communication between the places. They also provided a nice flat track for putting your telegraph poles and hanging your wires. Yeah, I'd never thought of that before. It makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense why you see those often paired together these days. Um, that's really great. Um, uh, Chris and Robin have asked, um, do you know what the future holds for fiber optic technology? Is there any, anything on the horizon there? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, they're still, still getting fiber to more parts of the UK and, and other countries. I know that some places around the world did a really big job of and, and pretty much got their whole country covered fairly quickly, um, which is something the UK and USA didn't do in the very early days of, of the possibilities of, of doing things with fibre. So we're still sort of catching up with getting the fibre everywhere at the moment. But uh, I think there's a few more years left of, of that and I, I'm not sure what apart from Elon Musk's satellites, and as I say, still at the moment, 97% of the internet traffic is going under the sea and not up in the sky. Um, I can't really think what would be the next development unless it's wireless like 5G everywhere. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll wait and see if that's the direction it goes in eventually. Mm. But yeah, yeah, we were very interested to see the, the developments there. The question I had was, um, you, you mentioned the cable, uh, cable station was shut down quite some time ago. Am I right in thinking that's, the, that's now, it's, a, it's the pub now, isn't it? Cable station? Uh, the cable station is the name of the pub, it's across the road, yeah, but um, the, whole, the whole place at Eastern House, which is where the museum is now, yeah, and some other buildings around, the actual telegraph equipment sitting up there was the cable station, and yeah. the pub called the cable station in. Gotcha. Is there any, just for people who might want to go and visit Porthcone and things like that, do, um, are there any other parts outside the Telegraph Museum you should keep an eye out for? Any sort of little landmarks and stuff? There's, um, I'm trying to remember what bit it is. There's a little, there's a little building down towards the beach, isn't there? Yes, on the way down to the beach, just be, before you get to the lifeguard hut and the beach itself, there is a small hut called the Cable Hut. If the weather isn't bad and the museum is open, then the front door of the cable has open, but there is a, a, a metal grill in front, so you can't go in because it's in very old and very delicate equipment. That's where the cable ends came up from the beach, and then they were connected to the shore um, to the lines that came from there up to the cable station and the testing room and everything else that was up there. Fantastic. Um, got another message here from, from Henry again about the Coast Guard. So he says, when he started in 1993, Morse was um, still going and ships went out, um, went out of range of any contact, went 250 miles um, offshore. Uh, and now on a cruise line, you can phone home from your cabin with no human intervention. So I guess it's just backing up that point you were making, just about how far it's all, it's yeah. all come there. Uh, and then another message from David saying, um, how many cables were there going into Port Kono? Uh, as in physically, how, how many were all going under that one beach? Ooh, I did know I did know the exact number once, but I'm not quite sure of it. Now. I think I think the number I heard was 14, but um, I'm not entirely convinced I've remembered it correctly. But I'm the best of my remembrance. The number that sticks in my head is 14. But again, it's worth checking out. I've, yeah, and Gareth tells us yes, it is 14. He knows more about it than I do. Yeah, that's great. It's Thanks. quite yeah, it's quite a few for quite a narrow fairly narrow beach yeah yeah how interesting um i had another point here somewhere where did I, i've got my notes here yeah you mentioned um there was a bit of a tragic story with samuel morse um earlier on in your talk could you explain yes. that a bit more? yeah it it um he said that he that his motivation for for wanting this quick method of communication and get involved in developing the telegraph and making it possible to communicate quickly was that he was he was obviously he was American and he was a long way from home and his wife was ill and um, he received a letter saying she was very very ill and, and dying but it, it wasn't it didn't arrive in time for him to get home and see her so and, and that was part of his motivation 
I hear, for wanting there to be a much quicker way to communicate. Well, there we go. I'd never heard that one before. So yeah, mm. fantastic. Um, uh, another one from David here. Are there any fiber optic cables going into Porth Kerno now, or are they all based elsewhere? Brackets, sorry if I missed that. No, I'm not, I'm not sure about Porth Kerno. There are definitely fiber optics coming in at Senon and at Bude. It's good, good to know. So yeah, right down at the end of the, yeah. the, uh, the county. And then do, do you know where the ones from Bude come from on the north coast there? No. No idea. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Um, uh, what else we got? We've got another one here from Chris and Robin. Who f uh, do you know who funded the early development of the Telegraph? Was it all just a commercial venture and on, on a huge scale, um, granted the significance um, for the empire, or was there some state support instead? Yeah, as far as I know, I mean the the, the, the funding came from the fact that I think John Pender knew that there would be a. a a demand from business for for that kind of information because if you could get your information quicker especially about when when ships were really coming back with cargo and things like that then then it was to the advantage of whatever business you were in so as far as i know it was it was the funding was mostly private like that it wasn't it, i don't think it was funded by governments at the time oh, interesting to know yeah I, I would have thought it was more of a government backed thing but i that would just be off what I reckon. So, uh, yeah, that's good. To, that's good. To, good to know. We're we're running out, um, or the questions are winding down now. So, um, what I think, if uh, if you've got any more, please do do ask away. But I think um, we've had absolutely no guesses for right. the, the tube. So it'd be it'd be great to find out what the yeah. um, what the answer is there. Yeah, I mean, just while I'm touching these, the um, I'll have to stand up. I mean, the thing about the, the um, sending messages by light rather than electricity, really, um, things got faster with electricity over the years because of digital technology and um, uh, miniaturization. So telephone exchanges could get smaller when they, when they were digital and things like that, and transistors came in. But uh, there's still a physical limit to how fast the switching between the two symbols can go. And the, the switching in optical systems is much, much quicker than in electrical systems and obviously the light is more reliable as it goes out and um fiber optic cable you can see possibly the end of this one there's a lot of you can see how many tiny little fibers there are in the end of there a huge number of them and you can send different colors of light down one fiber which are carrying different messages and there's a nice little demonstration of that up in the tunnels you can press some buttons you get a red light a blue light and a green light they combine in the fiber and then they separate out again at the other end so you can you can carry more more messages around anyway here are the the, the uh, two now the, the, obviously the first thing children say when they see this is that's plastic that's metal and because it's metal it's magnetic and so the, the first thing we have to do is, is is to get one of the children to hold the magnets put them on there and they just don't hold on to the copper at all because it's not magnetic it's not a magnetic material so what's going on is basically the effect that makes the generator work. You remember that the generator works because we move some coils of wire in a magnetic field. And it doesn't matter which way around you do it. You can move magnets around a coil of wire or you can move wires around a magnetic field and you'll induce a voltage there and, and the current. Now the thing about that is, we saw from other demonstrations that an electric current induces a magnetic field. It does the thing backwards. So what happens when I drop the magnets down into the copper tube, there's a moving magnetic field and these are quite strong magnets. So that's, that's a, a big change in magnetic field as it falls down. That induces a voltage and hence a current in the copper, which is an electrical conductor. And that's what makes the difference between the copper and the plastic, not magnetism, but the fact that this is a conductor and plastic is an insulator. Now, the thing about this current that's induced in there is that there's a law Called Lenz's law is basically conservation of energy. I can't get energy for free. So whatever change is making that current, the magnetic field for that has to work in the opposite direction to try to stop it. Because if it worked in the same direction, we'd get a feedback effect and we'd get free energy. And someone would have told us by now if we could do that. So Lenz's law says the current that's induced in the copper works to make a magnetic field in the opposite direction to the magnetic field that makes it. So basically what that means is the two magnetic fields interact 
and it slows the fall of these down. So if I, if I tried to throw this down so that it would get to the bottom faster, it sometimes actually goes slower because I've, I've made a bigger induced current in the first place to make it happen. So it happens because of eddy currents and induced currents, not because copper is magnetic. Because copper is not magnetic. So that's the reason for that. Brilliant. Well, great explanation. Thank you for that, Paul. And, um, and well done, Lisa, who when, as soon, once you'd started doing your demonstration, she guessed that it might be eddy currents. And so we did have one person guess it right in the end. So well done, Lisa. Well done. Um, super stuff. We haven't had any more questions. So I think it's probably time for us to, to wrap it all up. But um, uh, Paul, thank you very much for, for your welcome. fantastic talk and your demonstrations, all your questions. And what we tend to do at this stage is try and unmute everyone and do a little bit of a round of applause um, on here. So David, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting everyone and we'll just... Um, Give Paul a round of applause and thanks for coming on today. So thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.